In this video tutorial, we will discuss the topics of ionic equations and solution stoichiometry. An ionic equation is one where the aqueous ionic compounds are written as dissociated ions. So for instance, in this double displacement reaction, you would consult the solubility chart to determine the state of matter for each of these compounds. So as a review, calcium chloride, you would look up calcium, you would look up chlorine, and where they intersect will tell you whether it's soluble or insoluble in water. In this case, it says AQ, and if we look down here, AQ means soluble, dissolved in water. And so we write AQ. And we do this for every single one of them until we arrive at silver chloride. Looking at silver, looking at chlorine, and seeing where they cross, we see that it says S. And S stands for insoluble because it's a solid. So we write down an S. This solid silver chloride is referred to as our precipitate, a solid that forms when two liquids combine. In order for this double displacement reaction to proceed, water has to dissociate them, breaking them apart ion by ion. So when it says aqueous, it not only tells me that it's soluble in water, but also that it will dissociate into these individual ions. Take a look at calcium chloride. The calcium donates its electrons to the chlorine so that it has a full octet structure, but also donates its second electron to the other chlorine, giving it an octet structure as well. Now all three atoms have a full outer valence shell and have become ions. As ions, they are electrostatically attracted to each other in a crystalline lattice structure, with alternating positive and negative charges holding them tightly together. From our solubility chart, we saw that calcium chloride is soluble in water. It is it going to be an aqueous solution. And so the water molecules will pull them apart ion by ion by ion, surrounding the chlorine ions and the calcium ions. Because they are now separated from each other, we say they have been dissociated. And we can show them as individual ions in this ionic equation. Now notice how I wrote 2Cl- instead of Cl2. I wrote 2Cl- because I have two of these chlorine anions, and each of these separate ions are surrounded by water molecules. If I had written it as Cl2, that would be incorrect because Cl2 means that I have two chlorine atoms sharing a covalent bond together for stability, but that is not the case here. So please remember, you must write it as two chlorine anions, aqueous, floating around, don't forget the charge, and do not write it as Cl2 because that means something totally different. The same goes for silver nitrate. Notice how there's two of these silver nitrate molecules, so when they dissociate, we release two silver ions and two nitrate ions. Meanwhile, calcium nitrate releases one calcium ion and two nitrate ions. But when we reach silver chloride, Remember that it's a solid. As a solid, the water molecules are unable to dissociate the silver chloride. As such, the two silver chlorides do not dissociate, do not break up, we leave them together. This is called our complete ionic equation, as it shows all ions involved with the reaction. Please make sure that all dissociated ions have an aqueous state of matter and show their charges as well. Meanwhile, all solid compounds must be shown as being undissociated, still together. So it's fairly straightforward to write out the complete ionic equation. It's just kind of tedious because you have to write out the charge and the state, the charge and the state, the coefficients. It does get a little annoying, but other than that, easy marks as long as you're not lazy. Now if you look carefully, you'll notice that some ions appear on both the products and the reactant side of the equation. So for instance, we start off with calcium ions, and we end up with calcium ions the calcium ions don't seem to have changed. The same goes for the nitrate ions. We start off with two of them, and we end up with two of them. Nothing has happened to them during the chemical reaction. Because they don't affect the overall outcome of the equation, they are known as spectator ions. Just like spectators at a sporting event, they're not supposed to participate in the actual sport. Well, same thing, these ions over here also do not participate in the chemical reaction, so we call them spectators. They just watch. Now, by eliminating these spectator ions, we are left with the ions that do participate in the chemical equation. This is known now as the net ionic equation. So the net ionic equation simplifies the complete ionic equation, getting rid of the unnecessary components and focusing on the ones that do matter. Now you may also notice that I did not write down the coefficients, the twos in front. That's because chemical equations must be reduced to the lowest ratios and 2 to 2 to 2 is not the lowest ratio, it's 1 to 1 to 1. 
All right, so let's try a sample question. Some punk student breaks into my lab and tears the labels off four dropper bottles. Each bottle contains a clear and colorless liquid. The labels barium, chlorine, silver, and sulfate lie on the floor. So to help me identify which bottle is which, I label them as balls one, two, three, and four. Now, I don't know which one is number one. Maybe this is one, or this is one, or this is one. Which one's number two? I'm not sure. I just label them randomly, one, two, three, four. I then mix the solutions in pairs, and only three of these solution combinations gives me a white precipitate, a solid. So mixing balls one and two, balls one and four, and balls two and three created these white precipitates. So the question is, which ion belongs to which bottle? So the first thing I'm going to do is organize these ions, cations on one side and ions on the other. Because I know that when they partner up to form precipitates, it must always be a positive ion partnered with a negative ion. You will not see two negative ions combined together. You will not see two positive ions combined together because they would repel due to their like charges. Next, we check the solubility chart to see which combinations, which pairs will result in a precipitate forming. So let's look at silver and chlorine. It says solid, so we say that there is going to be a precipitate form. What about silver combined with sulfate? It has a star, and the star means slightly soluble. So I'll put this combination as a maybe. What about barium and chlorine? It says aqueous, so no precipitate would form in this combination. What about barium and sulfate? It says solid, so yes, a precipitate will form here. Now, based on my experiment, I know that bottles 1 and 2, 1 and 4, and 2 and 3 combine together to create a precipitate. You'll also notice that combinations 1 and 3, 2 and 4, did not create a precipitate. So that helps me to eliminate a few possibilities. At this point, I'm just going to randomly assign one bottle number here and say chlorine is bottle number 1. I don't know if this is true, but I have to start somewhere. If this is bottle number 1, then I know sulfate must be bottle number three. That's because one and two should make a precipitate, but I know that two anions, two negatively charged ions, could never make a precipitate, so it can't be a two. And it can't be a four because this also creates a precipitate, and these two would never combine to create a precipitate. The two negative ions would repel each other. That means silver and barium must be two and four. Now, which one is which? I don't know, so let's just randomly pick one. Two and four. Now, let's see if this matches with the data. 1 and 2 should make a precipitate. 1 and 2 does make a precipitate. 1 and 4 should make a precipitate. 1 and 4 should make a precipitate, but it did not. So therefore my numbering system is incorrect. Let's try again. So let's make silver number 1 this time. So as you see, there is an element of trial and error to this, but you're not just blindly going around guessing, because if silver is number 1, barium must be number 3. As I mentioned before, 1 and 2, 1 and 4, created a precipitate, and there's no way the two positive ions could create a precipitate because they would never bond together. So there is a way to systematically solve for this. Now if these are 1 and 3, then these must be 2 and 4. But which one is which? Let's just randomly guess. 2 and 4. Now let's compare our data to what we've guessed to see if it's correct. 1 and 2 should make a precipitate. 1 and 2 do make a precipitate. 1 and 4 should make a precipitate. 1 and 4 well, this one's slightly soluble, so you might have seen a precipitate, so it's a possibility. And then finally, 2 and 3 should make a precipitate. 2 and 3 do not make a precipitate, so this is incorrect. But I'll notice that there was a precipitate formed over here. So perhaps I can switch these two numbers, and let's try again. 1 and 2 should make a precipitate, so maybe. 1 and 4 should make a precipitate, and it does. 2 and 3 makes a precipitate, and it does. So this data set seems to match up with my experimental values. So now I've found a possible identity for each of my bottles. Bottle number one contains silver ions. Bottle number two contains sulfate. Bottle number three contains barium. And bottle number four contains chlorine. If I really wanted to confirm their identities, I would try to mix those bottles up with a chemical compound that definitely would create a precipitate. So barium ions, for instance, would definitely precipitate with sulfates, carbonates, and phosphates. So maybe I would try that out to verify that yes, I did have barium ions contained in there. 
while silver reacts with chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So I might try bromine and iodine to verify that this really was silver. All right, so by focusing on the net ionic equation and ignoring all the other spectator ions, I was able to determine which pairs of ions would react to form a precipitate, thereby allowing me to identify which ones they were. All right, so let's try some solution stoichiometry. This question should involve a lot of different concepts we've learned so far. So 25 milliliters of 0.350 molar lead to nitrate reacts with 15 milliliters of 12% MV potassium iodide. So what mass of precipitate is expected to form if this reaction has an 83% yield? So what I would like you to do is press pause, try it out yourself. When you're ready, press play, and we'll take it up together. Alright, so the first step is to write out the chemical equation so I can use my solubility chart to determine the state of matter for each of these chemical compounds. Aqueous, aqueous, aqueous solid, and now I know who my precipitate is. Don't forget to balance the equation, and now I can start writing down the information and organizing it in my equation. And now I can start, and now I can transfer and organize the information from the question underneath my chemical reaction. All right, so let's try this out. When you have no clue what to do, convert to moles. Now you'll notice over here, we are dealing with molar concentration. And molar concentration must always work with liters, not milliliters. So we divide this value by 1,000, giving us 0 0.0250 liters of lead to nitrate. We can then convert to moles by rearranging this equation into mole is equal to C times V. Concentration, 0 0.350 molar. Volume, 0 0.0250 liters. Multiply them together, and we get 0 0.00875 moles of lead to nitrate. Converting to moles on this side is going to take an extra step because we were given percent MV, but we won't have to convert the milliliters to liters because this equation uses milliliters. So plugging in these values, we get this equation, allowing us to solve for the mass of potassium iodide, which is 1.8 grams. We can then convert this mass into a mole. Mole is equal to mass divided by the molar mass, 1.8 grams divided by the molar mass of Ki, 166 grams per mole. We find this from the periodic table. And we get 0 0.01084 moles of potassium iodide. Now we need to find out which of these, potassium iodide or the lead to nitrate, is going to be my limiting reagent. Using my stoichiometric ratios, I find that potassium iodide can produce 0 0.00542 moles of lead to iodide, because it's a 2 to 1 ratio, while lead to nitrate can create 0 0.00875 moles of lead to iodide, because it's a 1 to 1 ratio. Because potassium iodide produces less product, it is my limiting reagent, while lead to nitrate is my excess. We don't trust the excess, it's just wishful thinking, so let's continue on with the limiting reagent. Since mass is equal to moles times the molar mass, moles of lead iodide is 0 0.00542, molar mass of lead iodide is 461 grams per mole, again we find this from the periodic table, multiply the two together, and we get a mass of 2.50 grams of my precipitate. But because this reaction is only 83% successful, 83% of 2.50 grams is 2.08 grams. So there you have it, 2.08 grams of precipitate is expected to form if this reaction has an 83% yield. So this is an example of solution stoichiometry. You'll notice that it uses everything we've learned so far. Nomenclature, predicting chemical reactions, finding who your precipitate is, balancing your equation, all of this is unit one. Mole is equal to mass over molar mass, percentage yield, limiting reagents, stoichiometry, these are all from unit two. All we've done in this unit is just add a different way to convert to moles. So what I like about grade 11 chemistry is that it builds upon your skills from unit to unit to unit. Now unit four, when we talk about gases and atmospheric chemistry, it's gonna be the exact same stuff, but all we're doing is adding new ways to convert to moles. So it's very important that you have a strong foundation in our previous lessons because we will only continue to build upon what you've learned. All right, so that concludes solution stoichiometry. Our next lesson is going to be on acids and bases.